smile on your brother everybody get together learn to love one another right now everybody needs to love one another a little bit more lately this episode of the podcast is brought to you by Dimmy Kelly's Barbershop and Emporium, located at 6 Kirby Road in Cromwell, Connecticut, exit 21 off of I-91. Dimmy Kelly's Barbershop specializes in all types of men's haircuts and hot shaves. Appointments and walk-ins available for full schedule. Check the website at dimmykellysbarbershop.com or call 860-502-3540. Gift cards are available in any denomination, and they also offer my personal favorite, their own water-soluble pomade. So go get a fresh cut, a clean shave, and an awesome product, and tell them Ben sent you. Dimmy Kelly's Barbershop and Emporium. Emporium, responsible barbering. Wait, hold the fucking phone. Located within the uh, barbershop is Cafe Vernaza, an all-organic shearwater coffee roaster, espresso, gelato, fraps, rotating, homemade specialty drinks, and pastries. Uh, authentic Italian. Get yourself some candy, too. They also got some Chinoto. They got some good old fucking Pellegrin. You go get that gut shit. Then you get your hair cut by Eli. Tell him I said hi. Uh, let's talk about a couple little things coming up in the area. Uh, do, do, do. There's only two. There's only two in this area for you. August 8th, entry, sick shit, corrode, Minerva, and Videodome. My boy Alex Burns invited y'all. Crunch House, Wednesday, August 8th, 2018, 7 p.m. Entry, members of Touche Amore and Nap Takers from California. Shit's going to be good if you want to go to a show on a Wednesday night. Da, 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 da. Then we have the closing reception at Five Points uh, Gallery, Annex Gallery, 17 Water Street, Torrington. Um, it's a nice little art show that was going on, and it's, a, it's the closing day of that exhibit. The showing is coming to a close, and the pieces are coming down. If you hadn't had a chance yet, stop by. This is it. DJ Al Gore on the turntables, blinky things in coarse language all night. Budget's blown to hell, so bring your own beverage mixers provi provided from the bathroom sink. I'm not really sure if this is the one that Alex is DJing. Either way, go on out there, get you some. Ladies and gentlemen, today on the podcast, I have somebody... Very special, a very special friend of mine. He goes by the name of Keith Buckley from the mega super band Every Time I Die. In my opinion, the best band that's ever graced the Warp Tour stage. Eh, that might make some people mad, but hey, whatever. You know what I'm fucking getting at. He's got a new book coming out. It's called Watch. It is a science fiction book, and it is dropping on Rare Bird Books September 18th. Sure, you could pre-order it somewhere through Rare Bird. Sure, you, maybe there's a link to it on his website. If you gotta go to Amazon, I guess, but I'm saying go to Rare Bird first. Fucking support your local little bookstore. Me and Keith talk about Buffalo. We talk about the hardcore scene. We talk about touring, being on the road, being in a band that's held their own for so long. Um, we talk about funny shit. We talk about his book coming out. We laugh, we cry, we live, we died. You like that? That's right, motherfucker. Ladies and gentlemen, I am not going to waste any more of your time. The one, the only, Keith Buckley. Every time I do See ya. that. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I have my good friend Keith Buckley from hey. the fucking legendary band Every Time I Die. Seminal hardcore band Every Seminal. Time I Die. <laughs> Find him in the seminary. <laughs> so I came to visit my friend Keith today on Warp Tour. Yeah. My annual visit to yeah. the fucking gravel, desolate parking uh, lot known yeah. as the Xfinity Theater. <laughs> Is that what it's called right now? Yeah, I right? think so. Yeah. yeah, and we're just fucking hanging out. Like this is uh this is gonna be a good one. This was dust. This was a dusty day. I know you didn't. It's see always the set, a dusty day. Boy, it looked like a vape cloud out there. <laughs> Did you? Like the earth was vaping. <laughs> 
There should be a band, Vape the Earth. <laughs> Yo, at the <laughs> a volcano is kind of an earth vape. Yeah, yeah. There, <laughs> there's a um, a mildly racist like um, <laughs> menu. The the gym I go to has a shake menu. Okay, and it's got all these weird names for all the shakes. Yeah, and there's like weird little like guys that kind of look like robots, but like shakes. Mm. And there's this one definitely like Jamaican guy, like big lips, <laughs> like dreadlocks, and under it he just says blend the world. World, man. <laughs> <laughs> so fucking stupid. So stupid. Every time I look at it, That's and so there's stupid. like a, a suggestion box where yeah. you could like leave stuff. Yeah. Like if you want, a new, we need a new elliptical. Yeah. And I just oh, always just write like, you need to take this guy change down. That <laughs> change that man. <laughs> so we're hanging out. Yeah. And we're gonna fucking, we're gonna talk that talk, baby. So, so uh, how? I know a lot of people know this, but mm-hmm. I just want to know, uh, yeah. and I want you to tell me, okay. how long has Every Time I Die been a band? This is our 20th year. Damn. Yeah. You I guys doing any, Have you? has the 20th year come, or is it coming up? It's uh, December. December is the 20th year. We you guys started gonna, in like December 1998. You guys going to fucking play a big show? I don't know. We do like this. We're, we're trying to start this new thing, which is I think what like aging hardcore kids do is um, have like a, a year festival. Um, so we're going to do it in winter in Buffalo. It's going to be around Christmas time. It's called, uh, Tid the Season. Okay. And we're just, it's just going to be a blowout. Like we're going to have. They've been doing that, right? We did it's it like last year. a toy drive year. thing. Yeah. So okay. we did it last year. We did it last year at this new venue for the very first time, which was an all day event and like had ice skating and, uh, curling and, and shit like that and wrestling. Um, but we've tried to do it every year for a long time. Um, but it's just been in regular clubs, but this time we're trying to make it like a real, like a barbecue. I mean that, the gu- well, the barbecue thing was like our, our template for what we were trying to do because they do this massive event every summer, I think where they just get a bunch of cool bands to play and just really blow it out. So that's what we're trying to do. It's not just going to be a show anymore. We're going to make it like an event that kind of takes over festival. the city. Yeah. Kind of takes over the city for about two days. That's awesome. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Is Earth Mover going to play? <laughs> yep, absolutely. We're going to get Earth Mover. <laughs> Were they from Buffalo? No. I don't think Syracuse? So. <laughs> Probably Syracuse. Because yeah. they used to come to every show in Connecticut with yeah. Earth Crisis, and I was just, I'd be like, Earth Mover. I remember, here's the story I have about Earth Mover. So I remember I was going to school in Virginia, at Virginia Tech, and somebody, uh, I was like really into hardcore then, like really into it. This was right before every time that I started. So I was kind of like, like gaining speed as far as like how I was going to burst out of the gates with hardcore. So mm-hmm. I was li- just <laughs> listening to everything I could and like, all right, I'm going to start a band soon. Uh, and Earth Mover was uh, a really big uh, uh, band for some reason down there. And they had a bunch of demos out. And I remember just getting a demo. I'm like, yeah, this is great. This is cool. There's like a hardcore scene. So I went to a show that they had at a house at Virginia Tech that um, somebody handed me an Earth Mover demo. And I was like, oh, this is great. So, like, what's going on with the hardcore scene down here? And they're like, oh, well, there is a, there's a good one. There's this, like, like punk house that, that puts shows on. Uh, and he's like, and Turmoil's coming, like, in next week. I'm like, oh, that's great. All right, I'll, I'll be there. I'll, I'll. I had seen Turmoil once in Buffalo before I moved down there. So then the next week I went to see Turmoil at this house. And, you know, I was, like, a kid that just moved down to college from home. So I was, like alone yeah. you know what i mean i felt very out of place but hardcore was kind of the one thing that i had anchored mm-hmm. it was like okay well i had seen this band in buffalo i'd listened to this stuff a lot and they were awesome i'd never um you know I, I i'd never met the guys or anything but they played and i remember going to the show and it was just gnarly like people were flipping out it was like this mm-hmm. little punk house and then afterwards i went up to the singer at turmoil and i was like hey man that show was great i saw you in buffalo and uh, it was like it was a great show then. And this show was even crazier. He goes, "Oh, really? So you like us?" I'm like, "Yeah, I think you guys are awesome." He goes, "Name three of our songs." Like, tri- what a fucking asshole! Yeah, did that to me on the spot. Like, did you? No. <laughs> what a I prick. panicked. I panicked. What a fucking yeah. asshole! I was like, "Wow, I don't, I don't." Sorry, man, I can't think right now. But I enjoyed the show. So, so yeah. guess what? What? I guarantee you, somebody that's gonna listen to this mm-hmm. podcast knows that guy. Uh-huh. So guess what, turmoil guy. <laughs> Look where you are and look where he is. But here's the th- here's the thing too. <laughs> Turmoil Tur- guy. <laughs> oh fuck. <laughs> Tell me the thing. Uh, so the thing is that Andy uh, Andy Williams says that Turmoil has the best guitar tone he's ever heard. 
Well, that kind of. Oh, right. <laughs> I mean, that tracks. I guess, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to mix up for it. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, that's what I do to like girls. Like, I used to do that to girls on Instagram that wore like misfit yeah, shirts. Yeah. Of course you do. Right. And, and I'm like, do yeah. You, don't fucking do that. Right. But that's that's fair because these people are posers. But, but I was at his show. And you were like a fan. Yeah. Like, that's like whatever. Yeah. Like it's that. Uh, yeah. You ain't fucking Glenn Danzig, right. motherfucker. <laughs> yeah. So it was a real turn off, and I don't think I listened to Turmoil after that ever again. <laughs> that made me so mad. <laughs> I could tell. I knew you. I know that you love things that make you mad like that. So that was a clutch story. <laughs> oh fuck! No, mm-hmm. I uh, uh, I said glass eater before because <laughs> I was leaving the tattoo shop in Waterbury uh-huh. one day, and my gas light was on, and I had to get off at gas this fucking anthem. like. <laughs> I had to get off at this like. Uh, this one that I'd never go to because it was like a Sunoco that was like a dollar fucking more. But yeah. I was like, fuck, I have to go. I get off. And there's like a van, like a, a dude's touring. Yeah. And like, they're like all standing outside the car and I'm like uh, pumping gas. And I was like, you guys in a band? And they're like, yeah. And the dude goes, want a CD? And I go, yeah. And he just answered me the CD, Glass Eater. And I was like, thanks, guys. I do. I well, that band, the singer of that band was like us. When we were coming up, we used to, we drove down to play like this Orlando Magic Fest in like 2001. And it was like the longest road trip we had taken at that point. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, we, I remember playing that. And the singer of Glass Eater was like a fucking like scene celebrity. Like I, I, I you know, Buffalo's small, but like we had Scott Vogel, so that was kind of like my experience with like a, a larger than life sort of person in the scene of like when that dude comes to the shows, it's gonna be a good show, and if he moshes in your band, is fucking made it. Yeah, yeah. But when we got to Orlando and the the dude Julio from Glass Eater, like he was like royalty. It was fucking crazy. I was like, this this is a weird. They're scene. from Orlando. I I don't even know. They were just there. That's hanging funny. out and he was treated like a celebrity. Yeah. <laughs> so I've wanted that ever since. I love that Scott Vogel is like this. Uh, like, I mean, to me, he was verified. God, yeah, <laughs> verified. Yeah, He's verified. I love him. <laughs> I love him. I ha- he was I here last Scott. year. I love. Scott. No, two years ago. Two years ago. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We shared the bus with him. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I was just hanging out with Martine maybe a, uh, two months ago. We all went to see Satyricon at Gramercy. And uh, we had a good time. He's awesome. He's, but he's very of, scary. He, dude, he scares he, me to death. Dude, he's one of the nicest. I people. I know, but he still scares me because I know he's into like the dark arts. And, <laughs> he's like, so he, dark. He could just conjure up a spirit. I don't even like to talk to him about black metal anymore yeah. because he's put me onto a lot of stuff. Yeah. But then I'll tell him like what I think is new and cool, and he'd be like, just "Fuck." fuck oh that yeah, shit. forget it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know. Lame. Like he loves Watain, and like we played a festival one time with uh with, like right after Watain or their dressing room was around ours or something where we were we there was a proximity between us and Watain for the first time ever mm-hmm. and it just reeked of pig blood oh I mean, yeah like it was wretched I couldn't fucking breathe yeah and nasty. Uh, I think I told him that and he was like loving it I'm yeah. like what's that's not <laughs> that's not something I'm <laughs> bragging about <laughs> I never I made it out to Buffalo one time for a show years ago when I was like in my teens. Did they ever do a Hellfest there or was that always Syracuse? Always Syracuse Maybe yeah. it was only Syracuse, yeah. yeah. Boy, Syracuse yeah. is so that was it. At that point in time, yeah. At that height of like the oh Earth God. Crisis. Dude, that, that was yeah. Now you look at Carl and it's like a he's like a he's like a meme now. Is he? He's just like a, like that picture of them in the leather jackets. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. you just laugh. Yeah. But back then, one of the most brutal hardcore shows I've ever been to in my life took place at the Bristol Skate Park in my hometown, and it was Earth Mover, okay. Earth Crisis, <laughs> Hate Breed, and Mad Ball. I think, and during so whatever, Hatebreed plays, Madball plays, whatever, and but during Earth Crisis, like all these like, all these kids came yeah. out. It wasn't like these dudes, like yeah. all like, and I, it was you know when you look into a mosh pit uh-huh. and there's like a crowd <laughs> oh, yeah. with a circle yeah. and just that is moving. Yeah, this whole place, there wasn't one kid that wasn't moving, yeah. and I just remember being like 17. Yeah, I was one of them, but when I stopped and looked, it was like. 
awe-inspiring, yeah. but also terrifying. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Freddie, like other dudes in other bands were like moshing. Yeah. And I'm just like, this is insane. Yeah. So in between songs, this it's a skate park, right? Some dude brought his kid to come skate, and he's just trashed, right? The guy's trashed. <laughs> and he's like standing, like in the middle of the uh, in the middle of the the mosh pit, uh -huh. and he's like making eyes at Carl, and Carl's like looking back at him, and the dude takes a cigarette and puts it out in his own hand while what? he's like making eye contact with Carl, and then you know what happened after that? Probably got beat up. <laughs> Vegan vengeance. <laughs> <laughs> street, vegan street vengeance and all these people are beating the okay, dude up okay but why I mean really think about it. like what how would that even don't even anger know. anyone it, that dude just angered, put out a cigarette you are smoking cigs at the <laughs> yeah, straight edge he so. also burned himself he burned like himself. literally <laughs> so these, his own hand he's literally getting beat up by like 20 <laughs> like small guys <laughs> and all of a sudden you hear stop stop that's my dad. And this like kid oh, comes out of no. nowhere, and he starts hitting Earth Crisis fans with his skateboard. Oh, this story rules, dude. It was, ask Eric about <laughs> I it. Can't he believe stood. This is... We we were basically holding on to each other because we were so terrified. I don't understand how you would be insulted by a guy putting out his cigarette and <laughs> like you want people to put out cigarettes if you're a straight edge band. Like put the cigarette. <laughs> you out. put it out. Yeah, put it out. <laughs> put it out in your own hand is the is the best way to put it out. <laughs> That's crazy. I yeah. remember. Yeah. I, I uh, like w when I first got into heavy music. I think my very first heavy concert was like Pantera, Biohazard, in like 1993. Maybe? Machine Head. Yeah, probably. Maybe. I don't remember that very well, but I specifically remember like wearing like a. I, I was just like a skater kid, and I I didn't really have any musical influence yet. I was kind of still on like my parents' resume as far as music goes. Yep. I was just listening to the shit they were listening to, but I was kind of starting to dress like the dudes around my neighborhood that skated. So they went to they wanted to go to Pantera and Biohazard. I was like, yeah, let's go. And uh, I saw a mosh pit, and it was like just yeah, like dudes, just men, yeah, human men, just <laughs> annihilating human each other. Human men. So that's what I had always kind of had in my head as far as like what a mosh pit is. But I very specifically remember then ver the next year going to Warp Tour, and the Syracuse Sluggers came out. And it was like the it was like Splinter's Cave from the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles of just these rap scallions just murdering each other like wiry little kids. Weird. Just thrashing each other to death, but not like <laughs> angrily. Like they were all a part just of a crew. Thrashing. Yeah, they were part of a crew, and they were just thrashing. And then eventually, the Syracuse Sluggers did like smash a car with the bats they brought, um, and I was terrified, but. <laughs> <laughs> and then I and then so then every time I die started like four years later and I remember we went to Syracuse and I was terrified I, I was like these all I know of Syracuse is that they're they're like dangerous you know yeah. and they liked us for some reason so I was like man that's cool I'm in I recently maybe two years ago bought a Cabal 315 oh shirt oh my god I remember seeing those all over the place cause they yeah. like redid yeah. them and I got one and it says like uh, on the back it says like fight the oppressor or something oh yeah and I sent him a message I go I need this shirt yeah and he's like what size I was like double X yeah. and he sends me an XL and I like I hit him back and I was like dude I said double X he sent me another shows one shows up free, at your door with a gun <laughs> free of charge <laughs> yeah so I, I mean I guess this is kind of a stupid question I should probably know the answer Was is that a band or was it the gang it was like a group it was like a straight edge crew but was there was no band around there, i don't think there was a band because then like the um path of resistance was like three different bands in one i remember yeah uh, yeah so yeah it got confusing i i didn't really know like just from buffalo or we didn't have anything like that i remember kind of you know this is before the internet so i would just kind of hear syracuse stories and know that there was mm -hmm. like bands and there were crews and then some of them were joined some of them weren't and i just all i cared about was not getting murdered when we played there it was like they were kind of like the courage crew of like that area yeah yeah like just straight edge dudes who will fucking smash your head open totally and i mean man that was and back cool. yeah. now looking back on it yeah. i i respect it so much absolutely i respect absolutely. it so much absolutely i absolutely do too cuz i was straight edge for a long me too. time me too and then you know life took over yeah. but yeah. motherfuckers are still yeah. 50 years old straight edge yeah, fucking good for them awesome. absolutely yeah it rules fucking I, uh, great i have no problem with it uh it was just very scary to me because and then i remember we went to Salt Lake City. So, as far as I was concerned, 
uh, Syracuse is like the, the, the hub of straight edge hardcore. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, then you went to Salt Lake City. Then I City. went to Salt Lake City, where I had heard that people actually were chopped in half with swords. So like, <laughs> and I'm like, wow, this is they've upped the game out here. Um, but again, you know, you just, you know, I mean, it doesn't take anything more than just respecting the scene you're walking into. Oh yeah. I mean, you know what I mean. You, you have know? to. Yeah. Uh, great. No matter where you Absolutely. are. Absolutely. Totally fine. Like we're just some dudes from Buffalo that kind of like heavy metal, and we kind of like hardcore and punk. We kind of like classic rock. So. I didn't really think it was going to go over too well there, but as long as I wasn't a fucking dickhead about it, then everything would be cool. And it totally was. Oh, and yeah. We've always had great shows in Salt Lake City, um, but then we toured there once with a band that wasn't cool, and they got the fuck shit beat out of them. It's like, man, it's not hard to just be cool. It's really not hard. I'm going to Google that later. Yeah. I'll, t- <laughs> I'll tell you who they are. I remember... Um, I remember... Uh, remember the compilation New York's Hardest... Was Black Train Jack on that? Yeah. <laughs> I, yo, maybe there was a couple weird off ones, yeah, but it yeah. was like uh, Fahrenheit 450. Think, yeah. Uh, yeah. Like um, a 25 to Life song. Yes. There yeah. was a Mad Ball song. It was one of those. Yeah. And I remember shortly after that came out, there was. Um, uh, another compilation that came out called Reno's Hardest, Sweet. and the front the front cover was this dude like doing a stage dive, obviously off of like a mezzanine, yeah. And he was like thirty feet in the air, yeah. And it's one of the most iconic like stage yeah. dives, like like pictures. Uh-huh. And it was just a bunch of crazy ass yeah. Midwest bands. Those are awesome because I mean, when you think about how hard it was to like be recognized before the internet, you really had to do work. You had to yeah i mean and and do something really remarkable for people to pay attention you know who did that who jamie joss he really did yep yeah that sure. motherfucker every every flyer that my brother held on to mm-hmm. that was like a show in connecticut was like his handiwork yeah and in the bottom were like little cutouts of like from 91 yeah. from 84 yeah. from new york from boston like you yeah you weren't even printing out your map oh, no. quest shit yet. <laughs> no no that's yeah he's I mean, been doing that forever oh, i mean he was you know uh, as you know he was the upper echelon of, of also dudes. another militant vegan back then was he really? Dude, Hatebreed was a vegan sh- band back then. I don't, I don't know if I knew that. Dude, Under the Knife, the fucking monkey on the That's front. right. I knew they were against vivisection, <laughs> which was the, one of the buzz terms <laughs> of the late 90s. Yeah, yeah. they were all they were all like yeah. militant vegans. Yeah. And then over the years, whatever, uh-huh. they went their own ways. But yeah. I believe he still might be. I just straight up remember being on... <laughs> This is so stupid. I got so I got that tape and just I remember being on the bus that a, after high school that went to the soccer games because I used to play soccer, just in the back row screaming. There's not one truth cast into stone, dude. I was li- only lies cast into flames. <laughs> Literally seven days ago, <laughs> I'm in the gym yeah. doing like an arm workout, yeah. and I'm it, it's like my 17 year old mind. Yeah, I talked myself <laughs> into getting a tattoo. That says "Seated Behind the Sun." Myths bleed into one, dude. Those <laughs> lyrics got me through so many soccer games. <laughs> he was, yo, he was m- more woke than Ow! he I, was woke before there was woke. There, yeah, like you didn't he, even knew there was a woke, and, and he, he was already woke. It's like, where are you getting this content from, dude? dude? You right. live in Bridgeport, and that's fucking also the thing about That's the thing about Carl from Earth Crisis too. Like, dude, that you that dude was using words like anthropomorphic, like. I was yeah. Like, what? I gotta look this up because when I was a kid, all I did was like l- find bands that use big words, and I looked up the big words, and I felt like I was learning. So like, Bad Religion, totally. Fucking Raging Against the Machine, Earth yep. Crisis was. I was like finding the lyrics and looking up the big words, and mm-hmm. then trying to incorporate them into my like everyday <laughs> language. What was the first show you ever attended? Uh, like heavy music. Heavy show. music. It was that. Uh, that biohazard pantera one okay and then i started like getting into like local hardcore so then it was Snapcase. okay was, like the real first where were show. were they from buffalo the, yeah they were from buffalo yeah. right yeah Snapcase was a huge influence on me yeah huge. oh dude they were they did everything right as far as i was concerned like just the the good riffs like and i i kind of like try to figure out now where they fit into what i liked at the time but i i loved jane's addiction and i think that daryl has a very perry farrell 
approach to music and his weird like harmonies and melodies and i i, I know that might sound weird but listen to listen to snapcase and think of of jane's addiction and think of the way that daryl like approaches lyrics and and his vocals and i think it was the same thing and for some reason i i got into jane's addiction at an early age and i don't even know why i think it was my cousin my, my uncle was a worked for a newspaper in Cincinnati and used to just send all these old weird CDs back to my house so I could listen to them. But That's awesome. Yeah, so then I got in Gene's Addiction and then I found Sam because I'm like, holy shit, these two dudes kind of sound the same. That's great. Yeah. I, um, the first show I ever attended was, the first show that I went to without my parents yeah. was Millie Vanilli oh. in Bristol, Connecticut at the Lake Compounds Okay. where they got caught. Is that it? Yep. At that show? Yep. That's where you saw that skip. I st- I don't know if I saw that part. Uh-huh. I was more focused on looking at the fence and watching droves of people sneak in and jump over the fence. And they played with Young MC uh-huh. and Seduction. Yeah. Okay. My second <laughs> show was Green Day and, uh, dude, Green Day, Only Living Witness and The Unsane. What? And I didn't even know Green who... Green Day Headline? Oh, yeah. It, this is Dookie era. Yeah, yeah. And I didn't even know who fucking Only Living yeah. Witness was. I got their tape, and I got a fucking Only Living Witness bumper sticker, and I put it on my mom's fucking toy. Why not? <laughs> and then, what, then 20 years later, you got dudes... Can you imagine having a car and your, your child puts a bumper sticker on your car? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Dude. Dude, uh, we have so many. Uh, there was this. T- <laughs> Hold on, I'll finish that. Okay. Re- t- in your mind, remember bumper sticker. Okay. Right. And then uh, the third show I went to was a uh, uh, Madball and Hatebreed show at the bike exchange because I was walking home from detention uh-huh. and fucking Psycho Jamie had st- stapled <laughs> it onto the fucking uh, st- telephone pole yeah. on the corner. And I Man. took it off and I walked home and then that was that. Dude, yeah, I mean, Jamie. He changed hardcore. For the East as, Coast, yeah, he did. As a, as totally. a lone man, yep. he changed it. Um, I got a quick story about Millie Vanilli. So my <laughs> uncle was uh, a secu- like the head security guard at the arena in Buffalo, New York, where they all the big concerts would come to. Yep. So like when the Sabres played, he was like uh, he would like head up the Wayne Gretzky security team if, if Wayne Gretzky ever came into town. Yep. Sort of thing. Like he was always the guy that was appointed to the most famous guy in the building. Yep. Um, so Millie Vanilli came through town and I had wanted to go my parents wouldn't let me and I was asking my uncle about it afterwards and he's like oh they don't even play their own music and I'm like what do you mean like what what do you mean bands don't play their own music he goes oh, that, he knew I was standing behind the stage with a guy who was playing the tracks on a record he's like he's not they're not even singing out there it didn't I couldn't believe that a musician could not play their own music like yeah. I had I had no experience I thought it was just all live music and he knew. Yeah. And then very sure. I mean, and honestly, this was probably the same tour because we're close. Yeah. Right that, you know, a few days later. And uh, that one of those dudes killed himself. Yeah. It was really years sad. later. It, it is, was very sad. And especially considering now, like, dude, on Warp Tour, there's bands every single day that don't play their own music. And to think of how damaging that was when a dude in pop, in pop culture, in, in the music scene, killed himself because he was so ashamed that he didn't play his own music. Yeah. Motherfuckers are getting up here every day not playing their own music. That blows my mind that it's going on yeah, here. Yeah, I know. Um, well, as a rapper, yeah. you know how many times I've, like, as, like, an underground rapper, you go to, like, a small show, everybody's rapping. Yeah. But then, like, I would go to, like, some crazy hood shit that no one would want to go with me. Yeah. Like, dip set or yeah. something like that. And one day I went to see Max B. Okay. And he rhymes over his own song. Gotcha. They're not just instrumental. Yeah. He rhymes over the whole song. Yeah. Like sometimes I'll have a song with like an ad lib track of or like yeah. a, a doubled up track, of so course. I don't need a hype band. Of course. But I'm doing it. Yeah. This dude was doing his own songs, and I'm just and people are like, dude, no one's batting an eye. Yeah. That kind of crowd, they're just into it. And he's like holds the mic down like yeah. this. Yeah. And you could just hear the music. Yeah. And I'm just like, dude, holy shit. That shit happens shit. all the time. All the time I see like singers like. Put it, they're, like they're brazen about it. Put the mic down or hold it out, and you still hear everyone's main vocals. Like, dude, where is this? Do you not think? Are, are you even trying to fool anyone anymore, or are you just fucking cool with it? That's so strange to me. And like, people have to play like their guitars and shit. Like, 
That's weird. They don't have to. That's they're so not strange. plugged in. They're not turned on. Do they? Do is it? Is it more like bands that are doing a lot of like jumping around and shit like that? Eh, because like it's not even like. I mean, dude, come on. We came up with like fucking Converge and Dillinger Escape Plan. I've seen bands. You can jump do it around. Yeah. You guys do you it. You can do it. You can play the instruments and jump around. The Your same brother time. Yeah. can play a yeah. goddamn song while yeah. laying on underwater. People. Yeah, <laughs> underwater. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't. There's it, no excuse. There is no excuse. There's no fucking excuse except for the fear of fucking up. But it's like, dude, the fucking up is punk rock and hardcore. You have to. You have to fuck up. That's how you get better. You know how bummed some of these young kids would be if they knew that? I don't even know. But, that, dude, that's so weird. I don't know if they care. There are some out there that do. There's yeah. some, like, hardcore, yeah. like, music-loving kids yeah. that would be totally bummed. I know 90% of them wouldn't be. Yeah. But there's probably some, like, a kid that plays guitar, like, yeah. in his fucking room. He'd yeah. be bummed to, like, know that, like, fucking Attila wasn't right. playing their <laughs> fucking guitars. And, 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 I mean, I totally get it. I, I, I would be, too. It just, it seems weird that that's kind of, like, the standard now. It's, like, it's just, you, you want the experience of the live show, but for me, the, the live show and the CD should be totally different Two worlds. Two different things. It should always be. Two it shouldn't things. sound the same. Never. No. It should never. You you need to have the live experience, and that means fucking missed beats. That means missed notes. That means anything. It's just it's live. In it's, between song banter, right, dude, fucking crazy yeah, shit. It's live, and some of these people. I, and I mean, I'm not talking shit. It's just the, the state of the world. It's I what mean, happens. Yeah, it's just what it is. But you know, we try to keep it mixed up. We have like. Five different set lists on Warp Tour, so we're always playing different shit to every crowd. So. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, you guys aren't playing the same thing every night. No, that's cool. No, that's yeah, very we'll, cool. We'll fuck, well, fuck, you got fucking a hundred songs. Yeah, we, yeah, Son. we have an entire catalog. Yeah. That's so sick, dude. Yeah, that's but, awesome. Yeah, you guys have been doing it for a while, and I really like like a band like you guys and like Hate Breed, like all these people that are hitting that twenty year mark. Yeah. Like that show is like they're. <laughs> Don't you never stop? And the only th and what's crazy is that like it doesn't it's not a gimmick that suspends your 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 career. I mean it doesn't it doesn't a gimmick doesn't carry you over decade mm. after decade. It's honesty that does. Yep. I mean really, if you look at the bands that are going for twenty years plus, it's the most realest dudes you've ever met. Yep. And you can say that about every single dude in every single band, whether you like them or not. You'd be like, hey, you know what? I, I might not like that music, but that dude has been real about that shit forever. And doing that as a job. Right. And just giving himself to it. So, yep. uh, you know, I mean, I, I, I'm thankful we're still in it for this long. Um, but, yeah, it's it's wild to, to come out here and just see how the, the scene has shifted so much towards pre-recorded tracks and shit. I mean, and I don't want to sound like an old man that's just fucking grumpy about, like, oh, they it's kids these days. Because I'm not. I, but the thing is, anybody older than you would be saying the yeah, same thing. It just, it's just a bum out because we... I, we make our our career playing music. Like yep. we don't fucking get paid for records. We don't yeah. get paid for Spotify plays. Not anymore. Yeah, nothing. So we have to put on a live show to to make a living. Mm -hmm. So when I come out here and I see like some of these dudes just fucking legitimately just pressing play and then faking playing the guitar, it's like dog. Wow. I mean, you, I it's mean, there has to be some kind of, it, it is kind of offensive, and mm -hmm. it doesn't feel like, why would you get into this if that's what you wanted to do? There's so other things you There's could do. There's so many other things you could do. Yeah, yeah. if you wanted to fake it. Yeah, you want to fake it, be an actor, for real. Like, get that's an acting. That's what you could do. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Switching gears. Okay, let's talk about bumper stickers. Again. Back to the <laughs> yeah. bumper sticker. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, when me and Eric were in uh, high school, there was this kid, Paul Gernault. <laughs> That sounds like urban. Uh, what, what, uh, what was that fucking thing from Parks and Recreation where they said rural juror? Like you can't even. It just sounds like you're just slurry. Paul Rolt. Yo, he basically was like a if Barney from The Simpsons was a teenager. <laughs> And uh, we used to, like, get different stickers uh -huh. and put them on his bumper. And he'd always, like, he'd never know who but it was. But was this his car or was this his parents' car? Uh, it was probably his parents' car. That's so fucked up. But, like, he would pull them off, and yeah. we, one day we put 454 Big Block. <laughs> Next day, a couple of days go by, it's off. Then we put this band, Toe Tag. <laughs> And then it comes off, and we would just go to hardcore shows, get stickers, yeah. and put them on the yeah. thing. And after a couple of years, we his his name just morphed into Toe Tag. <laughs> 
<laughs> but now, like, now that I'm a parent, now that I have a kid, I'm thinking about, like, if my daughter's friends were putting bumper stickers on my fucking car, I would be livid. But there livid. would be something, if there were bands, uh, you're, there would be something inside you that would be Of like, course. Wow. Yeah. Like, yeah. This is me. But you also just even, like, think about... Like throwing parties at your parents' house, where oh. you just straight up acted like it was your shit. Like I, all this shit is my shit, but dude, it's not. It's your parents' shit. I remember doing that shit, and now as like an adult, yeah. I'm like, I'm lucky my parents didn't kill me. I can't. Believe I would kill a child. Ab- I, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, uh, Strangle him, Homer Simpson, my, Bart Simpson style. My brother had a really huge party at my parents' house one time when I wasn't there. Yeah. And it was like, he cleaned up really well, yeah. and he never got in trouble. But I remember going to high school parties where shit like that happened, and it was like a wrestling fucking, yes, like, like WWF yeah. wrestling. Yeah. I saw yeah. a kid go right through a sheetrock wall one time. And it was probably the parents' house that just had yep. no idea. They just trusted the kid. No, it makes I, me insane to think about. Yeah, you have something to think about. Yeah, to know that like one day my house might be infiltrated by teens just <laughs> kissing each other. <laughs> And uh, trying to drink my alcohol. Dude, I saw a kid one time drop a bowling ball on a toilet bowl. <laughs> and then uh, one time, oh, so here's a good story. My father turned 40, uh-huh. and somebody gave him a, a liter of beef eater gin. Uh, that's good stuff. So all the stuff that was in the liquor cabinet yeah. over the years, if it was clear, it got put water in it. Yeah. And if it was brown, we put iced tea mix. Also, in it. how stupid do you have to be as a parent, as a as a hu- as a as a an adult? You gotta lock your shit up. Yeah, but all like I, I value alcohol. Yeah, uh, you know what I mean. So I know when shit tastes off. Yeah, that would never fool me in a million years, and nope. I I did it to <laughs> at least thirty five different set of parents, <laughs> and never got caught. How do they not know? Yeah, how do they not know? So. I took the beef eater gin and I went to a party and whatever. I ended up getting fucked up. And over the years, we took the Crown Royale. Uh-huh. We put iced tea in it. Cool. So we're like, just before I moved out, yeah. Matt's like 16 and I'm like 18. Yeah. And it's like a New Year's Eve and my uncle is like hanging out with my dad. The family's over. And they never drank the liquor. That's why it was always there. My dad yeah. drank beer and shit. Yeah. So I hear somebody go, who wants to do a shot? And I look at my <laughs> brother and I'm like, fuck. So there's like, there's probably like six-year-old Lipton yeah. iced tea. <laughs> In this fucking crown, no longer brisk, cr- <laughs> not at all. No, in this fucking this bottle, and my brother just looks at me and he's like, "Fuck!" And uh, my dad brings it out, and as he's walking by me, I can see like a difference in n- no, like fungus oh, yeah. floating in oh, it. Oh my god! Like this has been in se- f- it's s- six summers yeah. of hot, cold, <laughs> hot, cold. There's definitely something growing of course, in it. Yeah. And I'm just like, oh my god, what are we going to do? And I thought maybe my brother would like jump up and be like, dad, no. Yeah. But we just let him do it. And he pours a shot for him. He pours a shot for my uncle. They, they're they Italian, so salute! Uh-huh. And then I just see my dad throw it back, and then he just goes... <gasps> And he blows it all over the wall and just looks right at me and my brother. And we took off. Dude. We ran. But the funny thing (laughs) is, my aunt, my mother, my grandmother, dying. Yeah. Dying laughing. And they, I don't even remember getting in trouble. I I can't believe. Yeah. I I mean, that's so perfect because I, we used to do that to parents all the time. And I've never heard anything about anyone catching us. And it may, I wonder if maybe like they were embarrassed. Embarrassed, so they didn't say anything that they left their liquor cabinet. You got to figure, like, I'm dumb enough. I did this yeah. to myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You kind of have to take responsibility for it, but man, that is so clutch because, <laughs> dude, I, we did that all the time. Like those, those blue, uh, like a blue Hawaii. There used to be this weird. I don't even know what kind of alcohol. It was just blue. Yep. And then we, in order to. Um, refill it because we knew there was this girl that used to have parties after school because her parents were not home from 3.20 to 6.30. Yeah. So school got out. We would go over to her house all the time. So um, we kind of got used to knowing what was there and what was available to us and what wasn't. And I didn't drink at that time, but I remember they had this thing of Blue Hawaiian or Blue Caraco or something. Blue Carousel. That's whatever that, yeah. Yeah. And so there was a rumor going around school that if you went to her party, you had to bring a blue, like, otter pop thing to refill it. (laughs) So it was the same color. Yeah, yeah. So people were, like, getting it 
to just in preparation, you know, just to have like a sip <laughs> of this terrible vodka Honor or whatever, was, yeah, that they were gonna refill. <laughs> oh, man, yeah, I got to think about that too. And you know, I just, I feel like I know alcohol too well to to not know that I'm getting ripped off if kids fuck with my alcohol in my house. And then I, I don't want banned stickers on my car. How old's your daughter now? Two and a half. So you got a ways. Yeah, I got a ways. You got a ways. Yeah. But I like, even now I go to my parents' house. She's probably not going to do that. I don't think so. I don't, I feel like it's good that we kind of skipped a generation and having a kid. Like we're, you know, I'm 38. My wife's 38. Mm-hmm. You know, most people had kids when they were like 20 something. So yeah. I feel like we skipped a generation. So I feel like I'm, it's going to be the point where my kid hates everything I do. Yep. Whereas the generation before me would have loved everything I did. Yep. So I, I'm hoping that she's really just like, you're a fuck you you're this whole lifestyle you had is awful to me. I don't <laughs> I don't want anything to do with it. I'm not gonna date band guys, which is great. Yeah. Um but um uh, yeah so what I was saying uh, so I went to my I, I go to my parents house sometimes and like I my old door on my old bedroom is just covered in hardcore stickers still still amazing still like integrity sticker along the bottom like dude all these hardcore stickers and it's just like this weird uh like relic from 1990s yeah but the rest of the house is wonderful and clean and beautiful and then you just go down the hallway to this one door and it's just trashed with hardcore stickers I Oh, dude, I didn't, my parents didn't let me do that. Yeah. I did have a dresser, though, that I did that to. Yeah. But it was like Star Wars stickers and shit on it, too. But I remember um, back in the day, I had a record player. I had a cassette player, but I also had this thing called DMX that was, like, given to you through Comcast. Okay. And it was, like, it looked like a big receiver, and it came with, like, a, um, it came with a remote. Okay. And it was basically, like, the first, like, Pandora or something like that. Okay. It was 60 different channels, like, classical, heavy metal. Like, wow. And it was, like, it was, like, that was the first, like, yeah. all music thing. Yeah. I paid, like, nine bucks a month for it. I used to give my parents some money. And I used to just listen to all kinds of shit, and it opened me up to like weird shit. Yeah. And it would like across the front, it was like a weird LCD readout. Dude, I, this is weird. I, I think I know what you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. It was very yeah. cool to yeah. have at the time. And I used to catch my dad like going to my room to listen to shit because uh-huh. he was like, this is fucking cool. Yeah. Like, why didn't we get this for the other room? So, and I had my records, and I just remember like Eric would come over yeah. and we'd fucking listen to like the record that we got at the show the night before. Uh-huh. And my parents knew like a couple bands. Did I ever tell you that Rick to Life met my mother? <laughs> no. Rick, me and Ch- me and Eric brought him, or she brought us to a show, and we we're like, "Mom, you got to meet our friend Rick." And I also <laughs> brought Tim from VOD to my house, dude. Yeah. Wow. So we're like Rick to Lifetime friend, dude. <laughs> I have so many Rick to Life I, stories. Yeah, I know. I so know. I, uh, my parents only knew a couple different like names of bands. Yeah, yeah. So we're like listening to something like Hatebreed or Integrity yeah. or something, and we're like blasting it. Yeah. And my dad comes in, and my mom's right behind him, and he like kicks the door open, or we it wasn't even like that. We were listening to, like Pantera or something, yeah. and he kicks open the door and he goes. Turn that shit down. I don't want to hear that 25 to life mega death <laughs> crap. And we both look at him like, yo, we don't even listen to mega death. Like, how dare you? How dare you? Find- <laughs> yeah. I'd be offended by that still today. Eric was so offended. <laughs> 25 to life mega death crap. <laughs> that rules. <laughs> fuck. Oh, what the fuck? I remember. I got a couple good to Rick to Life stories. Oh my god! I mean, there's just Eric has told me he it, was a good dude at one point. Was he? He was a real good dude. Is it was he, very okay, weird. Was he the one that? Um, was there like a video flowing around the internet a few years ago of him playing like a party where he actually had like the background track? It's just a guitar and him, no drums. Okay, right, no at drums a, no at drums. a pool party. At a pool party, and there's a weird dude standing by the fence that just and like, there's a dude yeah. like rocking with like a pool, yeah. uh, like a keg yes, cup. Yes, yes, and he has on the uh, the bulletproof. Vest. Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, dude, uh, what the fuck? There was he was always just such a like. I mean, I dude, I, I don't know him. I, I, I honestly, I you know, not to. Despair, you don't I, I don't. I, I I never got into Twenty Five to Life when I was yeah. little, so I kind of missed that boat. Yeah, 
but I used to, I just remember seeing him at shows in like Poughkeepsie, yep. just straight up selling shit out of his trunk yeah. in front of the shows. Yeah. And be like, who is that fucking wild bill looking motherfucker? Like, who is this dude? Looks crazy. I wonder if you were there when I lived in Poughkeepsie, because I lived on Academy Street, like a block away from the Chance. Did you really? And like oh, my man. my band that I played with ha- actually still has the. Dudes from our band play in All Out War today. Oh, really? Yeah, it's very weird. Our huh. friend Jesse, that's the drummer. Okay. This dude, Terrace, yeah. that used to be our bass player or our guitar player. I played bass. It was a band called End of One. Ooh. Yeah, and we were like total black metal wiggers. <laughs> like, if you listen to it now, you'd be like, this isn't hardcore. This yeah. isn't metalcore. It's yeah. a little bit blackened. Yeah. Yeah. And, but I would li- literally, Jordan's in a backpack on while playing bass. Holy shit. But, I gotta uh, find video of that. Oh, dude, the, we, I went to a lot of good shows at the Chance. I yeah, there were some really good cool shows. shows. We used to love playing there. Uh, and one of the, like, I don't know. I, for some reason, what I love about Every Time I Die is we have a really good reputation with a lot of promoters themselves where, like, we just have a really good... We're in a really good place with them. So, like, it never really boils down to management. It's always like, we can just talk to these dudes yeah. and, 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 you know, these guys and these, and these women that actually set up the shows themselves where it's not like, let's... We can kind of circumvent all the, the fucking red tape of, like, management. And yep. we're just straight up talk to them. So we had a really good relationship with Juan that ran I a chance. <laughs> and we played this enormous festival. And then he just stripped, took the money, and ran. Yeah. Never got paid. No, nobody his, ever heard from him again. That was that. that So that was his, the day he did that. Yeah. Yeah. Rhythm Den Productions. Man. I played. We played a show. Because he did shows at the skate uh, at the chance, and he also did shows at the skate park in Newburgh. Did you ever go there? No, I don't think so. Uh, so we played. End of one played, and Hatebreed played one night on uh, New Year's Eve. Okay, and it was just like one of the most memorable nights yeah. of my life. It yeah. was fucking insanity. Yeah, but I remember he. Yeah, that he he had been doing that, but I remember he like took off to like Virginia or yeah, something. Yeah, he so I think we were this fest might have been the last time anyone saw him. Like no, And that's the thing, no one has seen him. No, right. He just le- just took all the money. We're like, "All right, uh we're going to drive back to Buffalo and how can we get paid?" They're like, "We have no idea where Juan is with the money." We're like, "Oh." And it's like fucking Charlie Brown song while we just slink back to the van and get in and drive home. Without barely enough money to pay for gas to get home. I mean, he straight up, like, was ripping people off. Oh, yeah. Needed that money. You know what I mean? Like, it wasn't even about getting paid to do, like, to fucking pay me for my time. It was like, no, dude, we need money to get home. Get me home and fucking eat. Yeah, man. Yeah. Yeah. So that sucks. I know know a lot of people that are still (laughs) still looking for it. (laughs) He's like Bigfoot. We, uh, oh, they'll find him. Yeah, they will. (laughs) (laughs) He's he's big in the cryptozoology (laughs) scene. Uh, I remember um, I remember taking so much mushrooms one day and I had on this huge like uh, like like the hat like a, a big like Japanese hat that they would like a right like the rice pickers in the field okay, yeah. to cover your whole body right, from the sun right. I had one of those on I was wearing a cold as life t-shirt this rules and I ate a whole <laughs> eighth of mushrooms and Eric will attest to it because we were talking about it the other day he puked, and I moshed so hard <laughs> that my limbs were literally, like, coming oh. out of my, my, my... I could have hurt myself, and one of the bouncers just was like... I wasn't even hitting people. Yeah. I was moshing in the air by myself, <laughs> and he thought, this kid has to leave because he's so crazy right now during Section 8. Section 8 was probably my favorite band for, like, a summer, Yeah, and he, like, threw me oh outside. Oh, my God. And I, like, landed on the you fucking, wanna... like, uh... Fire escape, and then I just had to sit outside for like hours. You waiting and Eric for need to do a podcast together. I wish, dude. I mean, you guys, your he, would be so between bad. the two of us, yeah. like that whole era. Yeah, like we saw so much, we saw a lot, but we saw the comedy. In yeah, it. yeah, of course. Yeah, here's a good one Hundredfold. Okay, Dog Eat Dog, uh-huh. 25 to Life, and some other bands at this place called the Globe in Norwalk. Nor- where's Norwalk? Like down, uh, like the little leg of Connecticut okay. going into the city. Okay. Being a teenager, some like thirty-year-old dude punched my brother in the face, and we like swarmed him, and it went outside. Yeah. So we had like friends with us that were older, and they weren't gonna let anything happen to us. But this was some dude that was like at the bar. Yeah. And he like busted my brother's face open. And we were like ready to go. So 
Rick to life is with us. And he's wow. like, yo, we're going to kill these motherfuckers. And so we, me, Boulder, like everybody yeah. from Hatebreed, him, a bunch of other dudes we know, there's a tight alleyway. And we see the guy walking, and he goes to this bar that's down the alley, and we're all waiting for him. Dude, there's like 30 of us. Yeah. He comes back out with these two guys, and they open up a trunk of a car, and you know what he pulls out? A, a Rick to Life demo. <laughs> <laughs> a garden weasel. <laughs> and another one, there was like gardening equipment. So a garden weasel, a hoe, and a shovel. And here they come <laughs> at us. And everybody's like, all right, I'm down to yeah. like have some like hardcore vengeance, but I'm not trying to get hit right. with a shovel. And Rick was like at the head of it. And everybody turns around to like go through the alleyway, yeah. but they're like bottlenecking. It's like <laughs> the running of the bulls. And you know what Rick did? He jumped up on top of people and ran over their heads and jumped out the other side while the people were getting hit with garden weasels at the other end. <laughs> I got a, t a couple minutes after that, I got a Heineken 22 bottle smashed over my head. And at the time, I was wearing Jinkos that, that, were, that, were, why. that were safety <laughs> <laughs> that were safety pinned to the little like thing on the back of my skate shoes. Shut up. I ran so fucking hard after I got hit with the bottle that I came out of my shoes, but I was running and my shoes were still like attached to my pants. <laughs> No way. Yeah. Yeah. I've never heard the move of safety pinning this. Because I was sick of it. Like I was sick of it. Like getting caught under my shoe and getting all frayed. So and my you mother ran. So you ran out of your shoes. I ran out of my shoes. Oh my god, dude! My head hurts in the back. It's like a really sharp pain that only happens when I laugh super hard. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, like that, like me and like we were best friends. Like he's still one of my best friends. But he, we met in like a uh, special ed, uh -huh. and we were two dudes that went to hardcore shows. We were the only two dudes, me, him, and my brother, and Pablo, uh -huh. and our friend Ryan, and we were all the only people that listened to hardcore in this whole like uh, in this whole high school. And yeah. we just were like, we gotta, we gotta do this. You gotta get, you gotta, you gotta be partners on a podcast. He, I think he he funny. should probably have his own because he could like really do something really yeah. good. Oh my God! When you go out to San Francisco, you hang out with him like, yeah. every time. Yeah, exactly. and I guarantee you, he's just telling no, you. He's he never stops. All these never stops. the same yeah. fucking crazy stories. Never stops. I've never, <laughs> I've never laughed. Well, until I, I never, I don't laugh as consistently ever as I do when I hang out with him. But I realize now that I'm talking to you, like we, I, I think I laugh like all the time when we hang out, just straight laughing. Yeah, we're just always laughing. That's what it, it should rules. be. Yeah, that's what it, it fucking should be. Yeah, that's, so that's what keeps me. Such... In, that's what keeps me in touch with people. Yeah, absolutely, and that's why that would be such a good set up with you and him because you guys are just like the funniest dudes I know. I've like definitely broke blood vessels in my eyes yeah. from laughing hard at him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, he's I I have a. Uh, this pain that I have going on in the back of my head right now happens when I hang out with him all the time, and it's happening right now. And it's like, it's it's kind of like it makes my vision blurry, but it, I just know that it means I'm having a great time. <laughs> I can't. The, the, the image of me fucking <laughs> running down the street with your shoes behind you. Yo, just bleeding from my head. <laughs> Stunned team. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, Tell me, uh, Tell me about your new book. Um, it's uh, not music related at all. It's like a science fiction book. Basically. Oh, so is, do you, do you tell a story? Yeah, it's just a story. And if, no lie, when I started thinking about writing a second book, I was like, you know what? I just want to tell a good story. Um, so I invented a story about a dude that um, he, he's kind of uh, he's a younger dude, but he's like suffered tremendous loss in his life, and it's it's the year is nineteen eighty seven. And uh, he lives in Buffalo, and he just wants to get to the bar to have a drink, and he gets stuck in a snowstorm, and he ends up in, encountering all these ghosts and running upon these scenarios that he had tried to put behind him, and mm -hmm. he's forced to face them um, before any, 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 there's any sort of resolution. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's not as long as scale. I think it's like 100 pages shorter. Uh, it's not music-related. So, um, What's the name? It's called Watch. Cool. Yeah. So I hope people like it. That's Very good. cool. Where yeah. can you find it? Obviously on Amazon. Yeah, you get it on Amazon, but um, I mean, it's 
they do keep them in like you know Barnes and Noble and things like that. And if 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 you have a local bookstore that you want to buy it at, just support them. Yeah, just ask ask them to carry it. They'll they'll get it there. So they're awesome. Very it's a cool. really it's a it's a very like punk rock uh, publishing house. I mean, as far as like the ethos is concerned, mm-hmm. um, they're just very very cool people and that you know they come to hang out whenever i'm around and i just know everybody that works there that's so, cool yeah it's awesome it feels like a hardcore thing when uh when's it drop so they're gonna start shipping in late september um but if you've pre-ordered it if you pre-order it now you'll get like this limited edition enamel pin mm-hmm. of the cover uh and then uh, uh we're we're trying to do this new thing where they're shipping out also um lyric books of the low teens lyrics Mm -hmm. um but they're it's just kind of put into more of like a poetic format i guess it would be it it would be like it reads like a book of poetry Um, cool yeah which is neat and i think you know that they're trying to emphasize the fact that like the lyric or the the writers um uh, and the lyricists that are on their uh on their roster that write lyrics they, you know they want to treat them as actual literature so it's cool because when you format it like that it, it reads differently anything anybody sells with an extra little like totally auxiliary of course collectible you gotta have bonus content yeah like you gotta have bonus content dudes that do cds or like tapes with like you can get the fucking album on yeah. a weird fucking little yeah. like a uh, like a zip like a flash drive yeah. that's got like something on it <clears throat> right. like yeah. stuff like that. That's that's what you have to do. You have today. to do it now. It's becoming that way. It's like you just you need some sort of collectible item. Yep. You know that that makes you feel exclusive. And, mm-hmm. You know. So that, that's cool. Yeah, it's cool. Very cool. I but, can't yeah. wait. I'll read that. Thanks, homie. Yeah, because I, so. I love you know me. I, know. I love science fiction. I know. I know you do. I weird know. Shit. I know. So this was. Uh, I don't know. I read, um, I, uh, I, 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 Solaris was kind of a book that changed my life. So, um, it was very, it's, this book is kind of in that vein of mm. like a world that creates itself in front of you. Oh, cool. Yeah. When I was in rehab, I read, I have a whole bookcase of only Star Wars novels. Yeah. Like weird ones that are just so weird and obscure. Yeah. And I still have them. And my fiance won't let me get, like, she wants me to get rid of them. Yeah. But I'm like, you don't understand what these mean. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. And it's like the coffee makers on top of the bookcase. Of it's like in the kitchen. It's yeah. like, but I read a lot of that shit. And then, um,. I didn't really get into anything science fiction past that. The first book I ever read in my whole life was this book called The Boy from the UFO. Whoa. And it was just like some Beverly Cleary shit. I love that yeah. name, though. It was, that rules. It was very cool. Yeah. But yeah, I'm down with anything science it's fiction. It's crazy because I never like, I don't, uh, I, I don't really consider myself like a, a science fiction, like, I love it. I love it, but I'm. I feel like there's a very distinct feel to the science fiction culture that I've never really gotten into. Mm-hmm. I, I just didn't really buy into all the, the the campaigning and the marketing of it all. I mean, I dude, trust me. I grew up on fucking Star Wars and you know, mm-hmm. uh, I, I, you know everything like that in Dune, and I just never Loved really, Dune. yeah. I just never, but I never really like associated with the culture of it. Um, so then when I was trying to think of a story, I was like, well, you know, what do I love? And I was like, fuck, you know what? I love science. I, I sure have loved science fiction. I'd mm-hmm. never, it was never really something that I had ever kind of admitted to myself before. So then I, you know, I was thinking about all the, the really good science fiction books I read, like Ursula Le Guin, The Dispossessed, and The Word for World is Forest, and like things like that. And I just, I, I love the, the universe that I created. So I wanted to write a book where this main character kind of creates his own universe, even if it's based on a faulty perception. Very cool. Yeah, Very nice. cool. I look nice. forward to that. Nice, dude. Um, I'm trying to think. I'm sweating like crazy. I'm, I'm sweating too, but yeah. it's all worth it. Yeah, it is worth it. What have you? <laughs> what kind of movies you've been watching lately? Um, <clears throat> like man, as far Paul, Paul Blart. <laughs> <laughs> we watched both Paul Blarts today. Have you watched any cool science fiction? Uh, not really. I mean, I liked Solo. Dude, I don't even, that's the thing, I don't even want to touch Star Wars stuff anymore because it's such a toxic culture. Yeah. Like, people are so angry about everything. Yep. Um, I liked Solo. I thought it was, I, I loved mean, that's it. probably going to, I'm going to, my band's going to lose like 30,000 followers now. But, uh, <laughs> I liked it. It was a good action movie. Uh, I saw Hereditary, which I liked too. I want to go see my <clears> girl <throat> keeps fucking like, I'm going to be scared. I'm going to be scared. Like. All right, whatever. I feel like there's a um, there's like this oh, there's like this overwhelming um, uh, theme in horror movies now where they take a 
uh, an old story, whether it be like a, a mythological story or a, a religious story of some sort of demon, and then they reenact it yeah. in a movie. They modernize it. Okay. Um, and then you watch the movie and you go, wow, I have no idea what that that myth is about. Um, but this is a good movie, so now I'm going to go home and I'm going to look up the myth. And then you read about the myth and you go, oh, okay, that's exactly how they modernized these aspects of it. Mm -hmm. Now we have to go see the movie again. To put it together. To put it together. Yeah. And it's very, it's catchy, man. I mean, it it, it, get, it reels you in because Hereditary is, is very much about like this ritualistic... Um, uh, you know, I, I don't want to ruin anything for for too many people, but it's you know it's about demon worshiping, okay. And it it actually has its basis in true religious context. Mm -hmm. So then you go, I went home, and then you look up the demon they're talking about. You go, oh, cool, that's what it is. Same thing with like the killing of a sacred deer. I don't know if you saw that movie. No, I've heard of it. I want yeah, to see it though. Great movie, but um, it's it's the modernization of a Greek tragedy that mm -hmm. I didn't know anything about. So I saw the movie, I liked the movie, and then I went home and I looked at the Greek tragedy, and then I watched the movie again. I was like, okay, it makes sense. So I feel like these movies now they're doing is like it, it unfolds, it like blossoms the mm -hmm. more you know about the thing in real life. Mm -hmm. But you go into it not knowing shit. At least I didn't. I had no idea what Hereditary was about. Yeah. I had no idea what uh, Killing of a Sacred Deer was about. But then I learn, and then it's a learning process. And I like it. I saw something the other day, and I fucking, I'm going to fuck it up because I can't remember the Turmoil. name. Turmoil. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's the movie about the two brothers that left the cult, but then they get a video in the mail. Ah, I know exactly what you're talking about. I can't remember the name of it either. Yes. And the name of the video, or the name of the movie, when you look it up, is a name of another, like, a love movie. What okay. the fuck is it called? I know Son, exactly what you're about talking a, about. Uh, a place, or fuck. Yeah. It's probably my Google I watched history. that trailer. I watched that trailer. Very Where they similar. fucking pull the rope, and yeah. the, the, the moon moves and yeah. shit. Yeah. And they go back, and they're like, we never sent you the tape, and right. then all the weird shit. And yeah. they're just like, keep popping through those weird little time holes yeah. all over the place. Yeah. It's obviously filmed, filmed in like the Los Angeles area, yeah. <laughs> mountain area, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. I watched that the other day and I was like, this is kind of annoying, but like, it's cool. Yeah. Thank you. Hey. Thank you for being you. Hey. Thank, Thank you, you for making me always laugh. Thank you for being a friend. Thank you. All right, fucking. <laughs> all right, Roz. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, my friend Keith Buckley. It's been an honor. Thanks, man. You're welcome. Love you.